Amen. You can be seated. Welcome again to Family Church. My name is Jimmy Scroggins. If I haven't had a chance to meet you, and I'm really glad that you're here this morning. And this morning, we're going to do something a little bit different than what we normally do. Now, if you've been coming to Family Church for a while, we do this kind of thing from time to time, but we don't do it really all of that often. And what we're going to do in just a minute is we're going to have a Bible study, and then we are going to invite people who want to be prayed for to come, and we're going to pray for you right here in this room. Now, some of you are thinking, I would never do that. I would just never, ever do that. I would never go to another person that I don't really know or don't know well, and I would just never ask them to pray for me. And I understand why you might feel that way. All the balcony people, everybody at the balcony, give me some waves, balcony people. I love you guys, man. You're the best. Even the people in the balcony <laughs> might need to be prayed for. It's possible. And some of you, that could be a little uncomfortable. You've never done anything like that before. But I want you to know that one of the reasons that we gather as a church family is we know that we have real hurts. We have real issues in our families, in our relationships. We have, some of us have physical infirmities. We have diseases in our bodies. We have issues that we're working through. Some of us have grown kids and we're very concerned about them. Some of us have teenagers and we're very concerned about them. Some of us are battling recovery and it is a battle every day. And what we're going to invite you to do today is to be obedient to God. And we're going to talk about how we do it and be obedient to God. And we want to invite you to take advantage of one of the great gifts that God gives us as a church family. Now, some of you are sitting there saying, I'm still not persuaded. I don't care what you say from the Bible. There is no way I'm asking anybody to pray for me. And that's okay, because that is your choice. We're not forcing anyone to do it, but I do want you to know in just a few minutes, I'm gonna invite you to do it. And even now, some of you are having this inner conversation well, you're thinking, I actually do need God to do something for me, but I'm not doing that. Okay, you don't have to. But if you need God to do for you what you cannot do for yourself, I want you to consider taking a step of faith this morning that God could use in an incredible way in your life. Now this morning, if you have your Bible, go ahead and get your Bible out, turn your Bible on. Grab a Bible from the pew in front of you and open the Bible up, if you will, to 1 Timothy chapter 2. It's in the middle of the New Testament. If you're new to all of this, if you're not really a churchy person or you're not really good at finding things in the Bible, no shame in your game if you use the table of contents, if you ask the person next to you to help you find it. But I love everybody to get a copy of God's Word out. It would be helpful to you. And then if you have this um, program, there's some fill in the blanks and some white space, and I would encourage you to get in the habit of taking some notes when we have a Bible study, and I'd encourage you to do that as well. And so we're doing this teaching series from the book of 1 Timothy, and this teaching series is called Winning Culture because St. Paul wrote a letter, a personal letter to his protege, Timothy, back in the first century. Timothy was the pastor at the church in the city of Ephesus, and St. Paul mentored Timothy, and St. Paul is writing to Timothy, telling him how he could have a winning culture in his church, a winning spiritual culture. And if you We'll take these principles. It will help us have a winning culture spiritually at Family Church and in your own family and in your own heart, maybe even in your own business. So this is a very important study. And today we're gonna to talk about the habit of a winning culture that we're calling dependent prayer, dependent uh, prayer. And uh, all of us in the room have things that we know that we need God to do for us. And if I ask you, I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hands, but if I ask you to raise your hands and I said, how many of you would admit that you probably should pray more? A lot of people would probably raise their hands, including me. Some of you, if I asked the question, how many of you wish you could pray more effectively? Because one of the reasons some of you don't pray very much is you've tried it a couple times, nothing happened. And you're kind of like, I don't, this is a waste of my time. I understand that. And if I said, how many of you would pray if you thought it would do some good? Some of you would raise your hands. And if I said, how many of you think we at Family Church should be a praying church? Hopefully everyone would raise your hands because we should be a house of prayer. Well, we're gonna read from 1 Timothy chapter two and see what St. Paul says about the power of dependent prayer as a church family. So let's look at this text of scripture. We'll read it out loud here. Here's what the word of God says. First of all then, I urge that supplications, 
prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings, and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good. And it is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this, I was appointed a preacher and an impossible. Apostle, I am telling the truth, I'm not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Likewise also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. And this is the word of the Lord, and God's people say, amen. This text is addressing congregational prayer and what we do in the context of praying as a church family when we gather. This is talking about what we do together like what we're doing right now. And I want you, if you just read the text, you automatically see the absolute dependence on God that is encouraged throughout this text of Scripture. If you look at verse 1, you have your Bible, so look at verse 1. He says, we're making supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings. You don't do these things to a peer. Okay, if you have a friend, you have a buddy, you have a pal, you have a fishing buddy, you don't say, hey, This morning when we go fishing, I'm gonna make prayers, supplications, thanksgivings, and intercessions with my fishing buddy. You don't do that. You don't do that with your bridge partner. You don't do that with the lady that you walk around the block with a couple times a week. You do this with the God of the universe. That's who you pray to. That's who you make intercession to. That's who you offer thanksgivings to. This is setting this up so that we are in a different category from God. We're dependent on him. Look what it says in verse three. Our goal is to be pleasing in the sight of God. And if you're a believer in Jesus, if you're a Christian, that should be your goal. You should be trying to live a life that is pleasing in the sight of God. Look at verse five. We're recognizing the unique nature of God as God. We're recognizing the unique role of Jesus in our lives as the mediator between God and man. We'll talk about that in a minute. Verse seven. We're recognizing God's role in directing the course of our lives. St. Paul said, he's the one who appointed me to be a preacher and apostle. And whatever you do, God has appointed you to do that. So we're recognizing the, the guiding hand of God on the direction of our lives. If you're taking notes this morning, if you have your listening guide, let's go ahead and start taking some notes. Number one on your notes, here's some things we can learn about dependent prayer. Number one, dependent prayer has all people as its object. Dependent prayer has all people as its object. You can see in verse one, St. Paul says, we're supposed to be praying for which people? Which people are we supposed to be praying for according to verse one? All people, all people. We're supposed to be praying for all people. Now you think, well, that's a lot of responsibility. There's like eight billion people in the world. I'm supposed to pray for all of those people? Well, in general, you can pray for all those people, but I think he's given us some categories about who we should be praying for. For instance, it's important that you would be praying for people different than you. If the only people you pray for are the people that you see eye to eye with, the people that you politically agree with, the people that you morally agree with, the people that you spiritually and religiously agree with, then you're not doing what this text says. This text says we should be praying for all people. You should be praying for people from different neighborhoods and different races and different nations. You should be praying for all kinds of people and you should not have any corner of your heart where you say, I'll pray for some people, but I will not pray for others. I will not pray for poor people. I will not pray for black people. I will not pray for white people. I will not pray for citizens of other nations. I I will not. If there's some category of person that you will not pray for, that's sinful in your heart because St. Paul says all of us as Christians should be willing to pray for all people. And that includes verse two. He specifically says, like, give you an example of people who are hard to pray for. Verse two, kings and those in authority. Kings and those in authority. It's hard to pray for people in authority, especially if we don't like the way they exercise their authority. So he's talking about kings, presidents, bosses, pastors, 
other people that you may think, those are people, they don't live like me, they don't think like me, I, I see them in some kind of, they have some elevated role in these different arenas and it's hard for me to pray for them because I'm suspicious of them. I understand why people might be suspicious of all those people. You say, yeah, but Pastor Jimmy, you don't understand. A lot of those people aren't even good people. So I can't pray for somebody if they're not a, a good person. And, and that people feel especially that way when it comes to politics, don't we? I mean, we can have some really strong opinions and personal opinions about people that we've never even met when it comes to politics. This week on social media, somebody did something I thought was just super cool. Somebody used artificial intelligence to create these super cool pictures of all of the presidents of the United States throughout history, and they made them all with these super cool mullets. That's a haircut, if you don't know, Google it, you know. So for instance, they had a picture of President Biden. Now, President Biden, in my opinion, looks way cooler <laughs> like that than, than he does normally. They even, they even had a, they, they, they made President Trump with a, with a mullet. Look at, Pre check out President Trump. <laughs> right? President Obama, look how smooth he is, man. President Obama's looking amazing. <laughs> President Bush Sr., I mean, I don't know about this one. This wasn't one of my favorites. I thought one of the coolest of all was JFK. I mean, look at, I mean, come on, man, that guy. And in honor of our president, who's, who's probably about to go to heaven pretty soon, how about President Carter, man? President Carter looked pretty good right there. Smooth with all that hairdo. I like it. Now, I put these guys on the screen. It's kind of fun to look at them like that. But some of these guys, some of you have extremely strong feelings about them one way or the other. I mean, I put some of them up there, and you almost want to stand up and start singing the national anthem. I put some of them up there and you want to throw tomatoes? But St. Paul is saying, who do we pray for? Some of them? The ones we like? The ones we agree with? No, you pray for all of them. You say, yeah, but St. Paul never had to live under the Biden regime. Facts. He had to live under the Nero regime. When St. Paul wrote these words, Nero was the emperor of Rome, the most powerful man in the world. You know what Nero did? Nero became emperor when he was 16 years old. Can you believe that? 16 years old. He died when he was 30. Nero killed his own mom. He murdered multiple wives. He burned Rome to the ground, blamed Christians, and then tortured and executed hundreds of Christians blaming the burning of Rome on them. And this is the guy St. Paul writes to Timothy and says, pray for kings. So if you think I have a hard time praying for people I politically disagree with, and St. Paul says we should be praying for Nero, who's murdering Christians, executing Christians, then I think this text applies really well to us. That means we pray for people that includes people that we don't disagree with. We need to pray for people, and the good thing about prayer is prayer lets you empathize and put yourself in someone else's shoes. It lets you remember that hurt people hurt people. So if someone's hurt you, just remember that someone probably hurt them first. Wounded people tend to wound people. If someone's wounded you, it's highly likely somebody wounded them before they wounded you. You. It's kind of so I've told you guys before, this is a little bit of a guilty pleasure of mine. Don't at me. If you don't like it, it's fine. Just, just leave me alone. But I like to watch this show called The Walking Dead. I don't know if you guys have ever seen it before. I've told you that before. So here's what happens. There's these zombies, and these zombies go around the earth, and they used to be people, but they're zombies now. And uh, what they do is they try to bite you. And if a zombie bites you, then you become a zombie, and you run around biting other people. That's wounded people wound people. Hurt people, hurt people. Zombie people, zombie people. <laughs> it's hard to pray for people that have hurt you, though. But Jesus said this. Jesus said this in the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus said, you have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemy and pray for those that persecute you. So when St. Paul says pray for all people, yeah, because there's somebody in your mind, some of you are thinking, I could pray for a lot of people, but I couldn't pray for them. You should. In fact, I would challenge you to go ahead and pray for them this morning. You should pray for them because Jesus said you should do it. Remember, you aren't better than other people just because you have Jesus. 
we're just a bunch of beggars showing other beggars where we found the bread. And the bread is Jesus Christ, and we should never forget that, and prayer reminds us of that. Number two, dependent prayer has salvation as its goal. Dependent prayer has salvation as its goal. What does it say in verse four of First Timothy chapter two? This is a very powerful verse of scripture. It says that God wants all people to be saved. Wow, God wants all people to be saved. Even the people that I don't like, even the people that I don't agree with, even the people that I don't know, even people who hate my guts, even people who would hurt me and shame me and cancel me if they could, God loves them and God's desire is that they would turn from their sins, receive Jesus by faith and be saved. And God wants all people to be saved. That's why he says you should pray for all people. And then he uses the same phrase, God wants all people to come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Pray for all people, why? Because God wants all people to know Jesus. So powerful, that's why it says in 2 Corinthians chapter five, another letter that St. Paul wrote in the New Testament. St. Paul said, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. You didn't know you were that important, did you? And look at your neighbor and say, good morning, ambassador. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty awesome. That's pretty awesome that you have been made an ambassador for Christ by God himself. He says, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Pray for all people because God wants all people to be saved. And you say, well, that's fine. I'll just pray for all people. Dear God, help all people to be saved. That's okay. You know what would be better? It would be better maybe if you just dial in on one. What if you had one person in your life that, was just kind of on your heart and you know that they're not a believer in Jesus and you love them and you care about them? What if you just had one person that's in your life, not some movie star you've never met, I'm talking about like a person that you know, and what if you just started praying for your one? Hey, can you just, if you're a Christian, could you just kind of clear the TV screen of your mind, you know what I mean? And just think of me like who pops up when I say, who should be your one? Who should be your one? Is it a family member? Is it a son or a daughter? Is it a mom or a dad? Is it a neighbor? Is it a coworker? Is it your boss? Is it an employee? Who pops up immediately to your mind when I say, who should you pray for as your one? Who says pray for all people, all people's good, but maybe if we just pray for our one and then keep praying for them and then just see what God would do. See if God would do something. It's pretty powerful that God wants people to be saved. Number three, dependent prayer has Christ as its confidence. Dependent prayer has Christ as its confidence. You see what it said in verse five? It said there is one mediator, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Hey, can I tell you something? A lot of people in the world are confused about this point right here. This is vital for the Christian faith. When you receive Jesus by faith, Jesus comes into your life. The Spirit of God comes to dwell in you. And when that happens, you no longer need another human being to stand between you and God. You can rate, relate directly to God for yourself. That means if you want your sins forgiven, you don't have to come talk to Pastor Jimmy or one of your pastors and explain to me what happened. You can just talk directly to God and he can forgive you. You don't have to go through another person. You don't need me to do any sacrifices for you. Uh, you. You say, well, you know, I don't like it that we came in with the Lord's Supper and you just give us our own little tax. I want somebody to mediate that. I want someone to hand it to me. I want to say, okay, there's nothing wrong with doing it that way, but you don't have to do it that way because the, the priest or the pastor who's handing you the Lord's Supper is not doing anything. He's not imparting any special magic to it. The Lord Jesus Christ has been crucified and raised from the dead. He is the mediator between God and man. That's why when we pray, we pray in Jesus' name. We pray in Jesus' name because he is the one who allows our prayers to be heard. There is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, the man Christ Jesus, Jesus crucified and raised from the dead. That's who we need. And the Bible says that Jesus intercedes for us. And that's why 
You don't have to go through a priest or a pastor to get forgiveness. That's why you don't need to pray to a saint to pray for you. Now, some of you grew up in Catholic. Some of you are Catholic. You're here. I'm not throwing shade on Catholics. I'm not. I have a lot of Catholic friends. We have a lot of Catholics that attend our church, and, and I, I'm thrilled that you're here. But I'll tell you the truth. This is what the Bible's saying. You don't have to ask someone else to pray your prayers for you. You can pray for you. You can pray directly to God. There's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And because our confidence is in Christ, we should take an intentional, humble posture towards God when we come to church and pray together because we recognize wounded people wound people, hurt people hurt people, but forgiven people forgive people, and we have the opportunity to forgive one another, release that bitterness that we carry in our hearts towards other people, and that will make our prayers more effective because our confidence is in Christ. That's why he says in verse 8. So he says some interesting things about men and women. And I know when I started reading that, some of the ladies in here were like, you know, wow. What's St. Paul up to getting honest about the way we dress? Some of you are like taking off your earrings, trying to cover up, putting your necklace, stuck in it. You don't need to worry about that. Let me, let me tell you what this means. Verse 8. Men, it says, should pray, lifting up holy hands. So I want to just invite the men in the room to just do it. I know it's kind of weird. I, should, I just want to invite men. Men, just, if you would, just lift your hands up. Could you just do this right here? Yeah, there you go. Just lift, look at all the men just lifting up their hands like that. First of all, thank God we have a church with a lot of strong men. I like that. Okay, just put your hands down. Now you're like, so Pastor Jimmy, is this what you want us to do every time we pray? You want all the men to like, no. Let me tell you what he means by that. He's referring to the Old Testament temple. And in the Old Testament, when you did need a mediator between God, you needed a priest in the Old Testament. Before the priest could go into the temple and handle the holy things of God before the priest could meet with God. They had this whole ritual where the priest had to wash their hands in front of everybody so that everybody knew they were symbolically cleaning the dirt of the world and the dirt of their sins, cleaning themselves before they go in to meet with God because God is holy. You don't bring the dirt of your sins, the dirt of the world, in to meet with God because God is holy. Well, now we don't need a priest to mediate for us anymore. We have Jesus. And so now we as believers, check this out, are actually priests ourselves. We are priests ourselves before God, relating directly to God through Jesus Christ. And we don't have to be cleansed by water like that. We are cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ shed for our sins. And so now he's just saying, when you want to do business with God, when you want to meet with God, men especially, you've got to make sure that you are washed by the blood of Jesus. In other words, you cannot expect to meet with God, to pray powerfully before God, for God to answer your prayers if you're holding on to sin in your heart. If you're holding on to sin, what do I mean by, by holding on to sin? I just mean if you're saying, there's this one area of my life and I'm just gonna sin. I'm never gonna stop sinning in this way. I'm gonna keep sinning on this way. I'm not even trying. I'm not asking for help. This is just a part of my life. If God wants me, he takes me and he takes that. Okay, that is how you make sure your prayers are not answered. Because you can't go meet with God with dirty hands. Now, I'm not saying that you have to be perfect because none of us are perfect. What I'm saying is you have to be confessing your sins to God, turning in your heart from your sins, doing your best to lay down those sins, doing your best to leave those sins behind, doing your best to disentangle from those things that are tangling you up in sin. You've got to have a commitment from the heart to try to live a life pleasing to God. That's what it means to lift holy hands before God. Now, some of the ladies in the room are like, Phew, Glad that's only the dudes that have to do that. No, that doesn't even make any sense. It's saying, men, you have a special position of leadership in your families. You have a special position of leadership that God's given you. You should lead the way in making sure that you are turning from your sins. And as you do that, confess your sins, turn from your sins, repent of your sins. God will make your prayers more effective. And as you do that, others will follow along and you will provide leadership in this way by lifting up holy hands. And he also says, listen, Guys, one of the big problems is that men tend to get angry, and we do. Men use, I mean, just in general, a lot of men, anger is one of the big kind of symptoms of sinfulness going on in our hearts. And that's why men get mad, and they, they use bad words, and they throw things around, and they break things, and they slam doors, and they kind of 
flex up physically in all these different ways. And you know what? That's simple. That is not how you meet with God effectively. And so he's saying, man, put all that away because that's just bitterness. That's just pride. That's just flexing up. Put all that away. Be dependent upon God. Turn from your sins. Confess your sins. Wash your sins in the blood of Jesus, if you will, and go to God with holy hands. That's what God wants from us. Okay, ladies, verse 9 and 10. It's all about you. You say, well, I don't really like that because he's telling me how I'm supposed to dress and all this kind of stuff. Okay, look, forget the actual examples. Those are illustrative examples that were suitable for that culture and that church at that time, but the principle remains. So I don't think you can go, he says not to wear gold and pearls, all right? I'm gonna wear topaz and silver. Okay, that's, it doesn't matter. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is make sure that when you come to church, you present yourself in a way that you're not trying to draw too much attention to yourself because the goal of going to church to meet with God is to draw attention to God. So that's all it's saying. When you get ready for church, don't think when I walk in looking like this, everybody is gonna give me their full attention because the goal is not for everybody to give you your full attention. The goal is for everybody to give God his full attention which also means it would be good for you to be presentable because if you are extremely unpresentable, that will also draw attention to you. I didn't really, hey, that's a woman clapping. I want everybody to know. That was a woman clapping. The men are just like, holy hands, that's all we got. We... But all of those would be applicable to both sexes, wouldn't they? All of us should come to God with holy hands and all of us should present ourselves in such a way that the attention is drawn to God and not to us. Okay, but how do we actually do it? How do we actually pray? Because we're about to have a prayer time in just a minute. How do we actually do it? Well, we've got to follow God's instructions and I don't even understand all of God's instructions all the time, but God gives us some very specific instructions about how we pray effectively in an environment like this when our church family's gathered. And this is written by James, St. James. And so I'm, I'm gonna put the words, but James chapter five says this, and it tells us exactly how it says, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church, that's the pastors, that's the leaders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil, in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up, and if he's committed sins, he'll be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another, pray for one another, so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. So it tells you, if you have some sickness, and it could be a physical sickness, it could be a spiritual sickness. It could just be a hole in your heart that hurts. It could be a relationship that needs to be reconciled. It could be a sin. It says confess your sins. You don't confess your sins so that the person you're confessing to can forgive you. Sometimes there are some sins that are so tough, you just need to confess them out loud to somebody to kind of get it out there on the table so it's not such a big secret. But no human being can forgive you of your sins. Only God can forgive you of sins based on the sacrifice of Christ. 